Hey, this is Emily Carr's Cleewick, Chapter 9, Greenville. The cannery boss said, Try Sam. He has a gas boat and comes from Greenville. That's Sam over there, the Indian in the striped shirt. I came close to where Sam was forking salmon from the scrow on the cannery chutes. Sam, I want you to go, I want to go to Greenville. Could you take me there on Sunday? Uh huh. What time Sunday? Eight o'clock. On Sunday morning, I sat on the wharf from eight o'clock until noon. Sam's gas boat was down below. There was a yellow tarpaulin tented across her middle. Four bare feet stuck out at one end and two black heads at the other. From stir to start, it took the Indians four hours. Sam and his son sauntered up and down getting things as, as if time did not exist. Round noon, the gas boat's impudent sputter ticked out across the wide face of the Nas River. The Indian and his son were silent travelers. I had a small griffin dog who sat at my feet, quivering and alert. I felt, it, I felt like an open piano that any of the elements could strum on. The great Nass swept grandly along. The nameless little river that Greenville was on emptied into the Nass. When our boat turned from the great into the little river, she had no more ambition. Her engine died after a few puffs. Then we drifted a short way and nosed alongside a crude plank landing. This was Greenville. It was between lights, neither day nor dark. Five or six shadows came limping down the bank to the landing. Indian dogs, gaunt, forsaken creatures. They knew when they heard the engine, it meant man. The dogs looked queer. What's the matter with the dogs? Pork pine, grunted the Indian. The creatures' faces were swollen into wrong shapes. Porcupine quills festered in the swellings. Why don't the Indians take their dogs with them and not leave them to starve or hunt porcupine? Cannery boss says no can. When I went towards the dogs, they backed away growling. Him hey you fierce, warned the Indian. In the dusk with the bedding and bundles on their shoulders, the two Indians looked monstrous moving up the bank ahead of me. I held my dog tight because of the fierceness of those skulking shadow dogs following us. Greenville was a large village, low and flat. Its stagnant swamps and ditches were glory places for the mosquitoes to breed in. Only the hum of the miserable creatures stirred the heavy murk that beaded our foreheads with sweat as we pushed our way through it. Half-built, unpainted houses, old before ever they were finished, sat hunched irregularly along the grass-grown way. Planks on spindly trestles bridged and scummed sloughs. Emptiness glared from windows and shouted up dead chimneys, weighted emptiness that crushed the breath back into your lungs and chilled the heart in your sweating body. Stumbling over stones and hummocks, I hurried after the men who were anxious to place me and be gone down the nas to the cannery again. I asked the Indian, is there no one in this village? One old man, one woman, and one baby stop. Everybody go cannery. Where can I stay? Teacher's house good for you. Where's the teacher? Teacher gone too. We were away from the village street now and making our way through bracken breast high. The schoolhouse was among it, crouched on the edge of the woods. It was schoolhouse and living quarters combined. Trees pressed at close, undergrowth, undergrowth surged up over its windows. The Indian unlocked the door, pushed us in, and slammed the door too, too, violently, too violently, as if something terrible were behind us. What was it you shut out, Sam? Mosquito. In here, the hum of the mosquitoes had stopped, as every other thing had stopped in the murky gray of this dreadful place. Clock, calendar, even the air, the match the Indian struck, refused to live. We felt our way through the long school room to a room behind that was darker still. It had a drawn blind and every crevice was sealed. 
The air in it felt as solid as the table and the stove. You chewed rather than breathed it. It tasted of coal oil after we lit the lamp. I opened a door into the shed. The pungent smell of cut stove wood that came in was good. The Indians were leaving me. Stop! The old man and the woman, where are they? Show me. Before I went and opened all the doors, mosquitoes were better than this strangling deadness, and I never could come back alone and open the door in the big dark. Then I ran through the bracken and caught up with the Indians. They led me to the farthest house in the village. It was cut off from the schoolhouse by space filled with desperate loneliness. The old man was on the floor. He looked like a shriveled old bird there on his mattress, caged about with mosquito netting. He had lumbago. His wife and grandchild were there too. The womanliness of the old squaw stayed with me when I came back. All night long, I was glad that woman was in Greenville. It was dark when I got back to the school and the air was oozing sluggishly through the room. I felt like a thief taking possession of an another's things without leave. The school teacher had left everything ship shape, everything told the type of woman she was. Soon I made smoke roll round the inside, the stove, and a tiny flame wavered. I turned forward the almanac sheets and set the clock ticking. When the kettle sang, things had begun to live. The night was long and black. As dawn came, I watched things slowly poke out of the black. Each thing was a surprise. The nights afterwards in this place were not bad like the first one, because then I had my bearings. All my senses had touched the objects around me. But it was lying in that smothering darkness and not knowing what was near me, what I might touch if I reached out a hand that made the first night so horrible. When I opened the schoolhouse door in the morning, the village dogs were in the bracken watching. They went frantic over the biscuits I threw to them. A black one came crouching. She let me pull the porcupine, porcupine quills out of her face. When the others saw her fear dry up, they came closer too. It was people they wanted even more than food. Wherever I went about the village, they followed me. In the swampy places and ditches of Greenville, skunk cabbages grew, gold and briming with rank smell, hypocrites of loveliness peeping from the lush green of their great leaves. The smell of them was sickening. I looked through the blindness, blindless windows of the Indian houses. Half-eaten meals littered the tables. Because the tide had been right to go, bedding had been stripped from the springs, food left out, water left unemptied to rest the kettles. Indians slip in and out of their places like animals. Tides and seasons are the things that rule their lives. Domestic arrangements are mere incidentals. The houses looked as if they had been shaken out of a dice box onto the land and stayed just where they lit. The elements dominated them from the start. As soon as a few boards were put together, the family moved in and the house went on building around them until some new interest came along. Then the Indian dropped his tools. If you asked when he was going to finish building his house, he said, Not her day. Me too busy now. And after a long pull on his pipe, he would probably lie around in the sun for days doing nothing. I went often to the last house in the village to gossip with the woman. She was not as old as you thought at first, but very weather-beaten. She was a friendly soul, but she spoke no English. We conversed like this. One would point at something, the other would clap her hands and laugh, or moan and shake her head, as was right. Our eyebrows worked too, and our shoulders and heads. A great deal of fun and information passed back and forth between us. Ginger Pop, my giffen, was a joy to Granny. With a chuckle and wobble, the fat, with a chuckle that wobbled the fat all over her, she would plant her finger on the snub of her own broad nose and wrinkle it towards her forehead in imitation of the dog's snub and laugh till tears poured out of her eyes. All the while, the black eyes of her solemn grandchild stared. Granny also enjoyed my duck pantaletters that came below my skirts to the soles of my shoes, my duplicate pairs of gloves, and the cheesecloth veil with a glass window in front. 
This was my mosquito armor. Hers consisted of pair upon pair of heavy wool stockings, stockings hand knitted and worn layer upon layer till they were deeper than the probes of the mosquitoes and her legs looked like barrels. The old man and I had a few Chinook words in common. I went sometimes to the darkened shed where he was building a boat. He kept a smudge in, he kept a smudge and the air was stifling. Tears and sweat ran down our faces. He wiped his face with the bandana floating under his hat brim to protect his neck and blew at the mosquitoes and rummed his lumbago. Suddenly, his eye would catch the comic face of Ginger Pop and he too would throw down his tools and give himself up to mirth at the pup's expense. When he laughed, that was the time to ask him things. I'm sorry that there are no totem poles in Greenville. I like totem poles, I said. Halo totem stick copa Greenville. Old village with totem poles stop up the nas? Uh-huh. I would like to see them. Uh-huh. Will you take me in your boat? Uh-huh. Halo tilikin copet. I want to see the poles, not people. You take me tomorrow? Uh-huh. So we went to Jitix and Angadar, two old village sites on the Nass River. His old boat crept through the tide wash meanderings of the Nass. Suddenly, suddenly we came out onto its turbulent waters and shot across them, and there, tipping drunkenly over the top of dense growth, were the totem poles of Jitix. They looked like mere sticks in the vast sea of green that had swallowed the old village. Once they too had been forest trees, till the Indian mutilated and turned them into bare poles. Then he enriched the shorn things with carvings. He wanted some way of showing people things that were in his mind, things about the creatures and about himself and their relations to each other. He cut forearms to fit the thoughts that the birds and animals and fish suggested to him, and to these he added something of himself. When they were all linked together, they made very strong talk for the people. He grafted this new language onto the great cedar trunks and called them totem poles and stuck them up in the villages with great ceremony. Then the cedar and the creatures and the man all talked together through the totem poles to the people. The carver did even more. He let his imaginings rise above the objects that he saw and pictured supernatural beings too. The creatures that had flesh and blood like themselves, the Indians understood. They accepted them as their ancestors, but the supernatural things they feared and tried to propitiate. Every clan took a creature for its particular crest. Individuals had private crests too, which they earned for themselves, often by privation and torture and fasting. These totem creatures were believed to help specially those who were at their crest. When you looked at a man's pole, his crest told you who he was, whom he might marry, and whom he might not marry, for people of the same crest were forbidden to marry each other. You knew also by the totem what sort of man he was, or at least what he should be, because men tried to be like the creature of their crest, fierce or brave or wise or strong. When then the missionaries came and took the Indians away from their old villages and the totem poles and put them into new places where life was easier, where they bought things from a store instead of taking them from nature. Greenville, which the Indians called La, Cas La Calza, was one of these new villages. They took no totem poles with them to hamper their progress in new ways. The poles were left, stand were left standing in the old places. But now there was no one to listen to their talk anymore. By and by they would rot and topple to the earth unless white men came and carried them away to museums. There they would be labeled as exhibits, dumb before the crowds who gaped and laughed and said, this is the distorted foolishness of an uncivilized people. And the poor poles could not talk back because the white man did not understand their language. At Gitex, there was a wooden bear on top of such a high pole that he was able still to look over the top of the woods. He was a joke of a bear. Every bit of him was merry. 
He had one paw up against his face. He bent forward and his feet clung to the pole. I tried to circle about so that I could see his face, but the monstrous tangle was impossible to break through. I did beat my way to the base of another pole, only to find myself drowned under an avalanche of growth sweeping down the valley. The dog and I were alone in it, just nothings in the overwhelming immensity. My Indian had gone out to mid-river. It seemed an awful thing to shatter that silence with a shout, but I was hungry and I dared not raise my veil till I got far out onto the nas. Mosquitoes would have filled my mouth. After seven days, the Indians came back with their boat and took me down the Nas again. I left the old man and woman leisurely busy, the woman at her wash tub and the man in his stifling boathouse. Each gave me a passing grin and a nod when I said goodbye. Comings and goings are as ordinary to Indians as breathing. I let the clock run down, flapped the leaves of the calendar back, and shut the Greenville schoolhouse tight. The dogs followed to the edge of the water, their stomachs and hearts sore at seeing us go. Perhaps, in a way, dogs are more domestic and more responsive than Indians.